uh, webinar on flexible meetings. I hope you've just finished your Joe Wicks workout and you're ready for some uh, intellectual stimulation. Um, first of all, I would say I hope you're all well and that uh, we wish you remain that way. Second of all, we have have a large number of people logged in, as I understand it. Um, we have time for a few questions at the end. Um, if you, we've had some written ones already. We've got six questions, uh, which may take up all our time, but there may be time for a few more. So if you uh, want to write them in using the written function, please do so. I cannot promise we'll get to them though. Thirdly, if we, if we mention some documents, uh, they will all be available on request from the clerks and there'll be a slide um, at the end of the screen uh, showing you uh, an email address if you uh, need to request anything. For instance, I'm going to mention a meeting, a virtual me full council meeting by Angus Council, which I know is in Scotland, but they have a similar provision um, and we have available their uh, committee report and the changes they made to their standing orders and committee structures to deal with the current crisis. Um, fourthly, we, we aim to speak for about 30 minutes. There are five of us, uh, I hope, uh, and uh, we will then have some time for questions and we aim to wrap up um, after about 45 minutes, so um, at about 10.15. Our aim today is to give you an overview of the regulations and to pick up some of the points that we think may arise the, to start you off with avenues of investigation. Um, we're not in a position, we don't have the time this morning anyway, to give you a full in-depth um, consideration of every possible issue that may arise. Um, what we're hoping to do is to first of all give you an overview. Uh, secondly, I will then talk about uh, some of the practicalities of the issues arising from meetings. Then there'll be, uh, Isabella will talk about notice requirements. Matt Lewin will talk about hosting and webcasting meters and data protection. And Damien will talk about um, uh, supplier documents and inspection and FOI issues. But I'll first of all pass you over to Rushi, who's going to give you an overview of the regulations. Uh, thank you, Rushi. Thanks, James. Um, right, so as James has indicated, I will be covering the headline points that emerge from the regulations. Um, so there are six points, key points, which are aimed at allowing local authorities to conduct business flexibly during this period. And I'll go through each in turn. First, you can hold and alter the frequency of your meetings without requirements for further notice. And this is an issue that Isabella will be discussing in further detail shortly. Second, the regulations remove existing requirements for local authorities to hold an annual meeting. And I know this is welcomed by most councils uh, because of the amount of work that it will, it will involve um, for full council to attend virtually. Third, where an authority doesn't hold an annual meeting, your current appointments will simply roll over or continue until the next annual meeting or when the local authority decides. And this ensures continuity of membership. Fourth, meetings, um, so this includes any annual meetings or others, can all be held remotely. Now, the regulations are not prescriptive, so this can be done by telephone conferencing, video conferencing, live webcast, etc. Uh, and Matt will discuss some of the practical and GDPR considerations arising out of uh, this key provision. Fifth, the requirements for public and press access to meetings as well as to documents can also be complied through similar remote access. And this is something that James and Damien will both touch upon. And then sixth is that you can now make standing orders um, in respect of remote meetings. And this may relate to things like um, uh, voting, access to documents, access um, for public or press. And the key thing here is that you will not be constrained by any existing restrictions in your standing orders or any other rules. One point worth noting at this stage is that, um, in fact, many councils will be looking to push off their annual meeting, sorry, their annual meeting, and indeed any full council meeting, 
Um, but of course, if you are to change your standing orders or introduce new standing orders, um, that is of course a constitutional change and you will need to determine that by full council. Um, so effectively to avail of this, the flexible standing orders provision, you will need to still have a full council meeting. And perhaps this is a, a practical point that we can come back to later in the Q&A. Moving on to the scope of the regulations then, um, the six key points I've just covered apply only in England. They apply to local authorities and that term is drafted very broadly in the regs. It will apply to different types of legal authorities and indeed to different categories, all categories of meetings. So annual meetings, cabinet, committee, subcommittee, etc. Um, they are already in force and they will continue in force until the 7th of May next year. Um, of course, that date might be brought forward if scientific advice leads to the relaxation of social distancing rules. Um, but at this stage, um, we're very much in this new virtual world territory. Um, and I will now hand back to James. Thank you, Rishi. Um, the purpose of my five minutes now is to talk to you about practical protocols and potential changes to constitutional arrangements uh, you may have in mind, because the, the meetings have to be seen in the broader framework of the need to reduce the need for meetings and to make such meetings more manageable. Uh, and just to, uh, the one piece of practical advice I would give overall is, is the need for practice and, and not to expect that meetings will uh, proceed with, uh, without a glitch. Um, even setting up this webinar with the five of us involved, we've had a practice session, we've had another session this morning, and it remains to be seen whether you will see all of us live or not. Um, and uh, we are ostensibly meant to be at least uh, reasonably literate in use of computers, whereas dealing with some members and some members of the public, uh, those issues will um, be uh, much greater. Um, so in terms of practical protocols for meetings, um, I mentioned earlier in the introduction that um, a, a council in Scotland had carried a f out a full council meeting uh, on Friday, uh, Angus Council. There, there has been a provision in the Scottish legislation for remote participation in meetings for some time now. And um, uh, again, if you're interested, Highland Council has a protocol for remote access for members. Obviously, slightly different that that's just individual members, but it gives some indication of the type of um, consideration you have to have in mind, uh, such as uh, what happens if the connections go, uh, how you deal with confidential items, document handling. But it, it makes it clear that the role of the chair and the deputy chair in the meeting will be of uh, considerable importance and indeed um, like a potentially like a planning inquiry a, some a program officer or, a, or someone in charge of the of the um, platform which Matt will talk about in, in more detail in due course uh, may be an, an essential uh, participant in, in ensuring the meetings actually uh, occur um, the overriding uh, point to bear in mind, in my view, is that um, looking at the regulations, say for when you allow members of the public to speak, um, it's a meeting in public most often, not a public meeting. So that simply requires that members of the public can hear what's happening, um, but they don't have to um, take part in the meeting unless there's a specific obligation to allow them to do so. Um, so those were my thoughts on, on, on the meeting protocol. Uh, it, it's really important to put some, to, to have that clearly set out so that people understand what they should be doing at what stage and who's, in, who's running the meeting. Uh, We'll, there's a question that hopefully we'll get to later about um, what being heard, members being heard of and seen at practical at all times actually means. Uh, but in my view, using a, a platform like Zoom, it should be possible for members to be heard and to hear at, at all times. 
Then moving on to uh, potential changes to the constitution that you uh, may uh, wish to consider, uh, depending on how long uh, this um, crisis continues for, you might wish to consider, for instance, reducing the size of committees uh, so that the practicalities of involving uh, numbers of people are reduced. There may be issues with uh, political uh, balance with that. Uh, much easier to do if there's uh, agreement amongst the parties that uh, constitute the council. M more difficult to um, reach agreement if there's um, uh, a very close um, balance within the council, potentially. Uh, but reducing the size of committees, uh, <clears throat> giving some consideration to uh, your rules as to quorums, um, because what happens if a link goes? Uh, and uh, there is obviously some interaction between the size of committee and the size of quorums. But again, these are uh, matters that you may wish to consider. Review delegation to officers to, to limit committee workload. Um, this is something that, uh, again, harking back to my example from Angus that they've done. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, council constitutions have um, emergency powers, which I'll uh, refer to in a moment. Uh, but uh, the, the practicalities of uh, committee hearing, the trying to increase the amount of committee workload or in, indeed executive function workload. Uh, may be um, a sensible step to consider. Reviewing rights to address committees and council uh, and the council in full. These are usually enshrined in, in standing orders or in, in particular provisions within a constitution. They may again require consideration depending on how long the current um, crisis continues for. Uh, give some consideration to document handling. Uh, again, um, the uh, length of reports, the uh, number of appendices to reports um, should be streamlined as much as possible to ensure that um, when you do have a virtual meeting, that virtual meeting can run as smoothly as possible. And, and lastly, uh, consider expanding the emergency power of officers. <coughs> um, no doubt in consultation with uh, members. Um, just a, a reminder that um, you can delegate to a single officer or officers. You cannot delegate to a single member, um, but you can delegate to officers uh, and make it a condition of that delegation that they consult before taking a decision um, with members or with specified members. So th those uh, are the type of matters that you should be considering when setting up the ground rules for um, whether you're going to have a virtual meeting. And if you are going to have a virtual the meeting of full council, try and get yourself into a, a, a position where you can function uh, with some political input uh, during the course of the current crisis. Um, that's all, all I um, have to say on that at this stage, and I shall pass over to Isabella now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the provisions in the regulations which deal with notice requirements. They're a little bit fiddly, but there are two significant points to note. The first is that the five clear days notice requirement, which already exists under the Local Government Act 1972, still applies, albeit that this can now be complied with by giving notice on the Council's website rather than just being published on the council's offices. This comes from Regulation 6E of the new regulations, which amends the current position under Schedule 12 of the 72 Act. There's no change to what is meant by meeting of a principal council. That's defined in Section 270 of the 72 Act. Um, and it seems from case law in relation to Act, that Act, that this definitely includes committees and subcommittee meetings. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Matt. And the, the more significant change comes from Regulation 4.1, which provides that authorities may, as they may determine, hold such meetings at such hour and on such days, and alter the frequency, move or cancel meetings without the requirement for further notice. The key words there are further notice. This surely means that if you are required to give notice of a meeting and have given such notice, 
but you need to rearrange or cancel the meeting or move it to another online platform, you can do so without giving further notice of that change. The explanatory memorandum which accompanies the regulations and the letter which was sent to the chief executives on Monday both tell us that the purpose of this provision is to give local authorities flexibility in when and how they hold the meetings in order to respond to the current and certain circumstances. That flexibility is not wholly unfettered though. Local authorities still need to comply with their public law obligations and will need to be particularly conscious of any legitimate expectations that members of the public might have in relation to asking questions or making representations. As James mentioned in his um, section of the presentation, these are still meant to be meetings held in public. Um, so if notice has been given of a meeting um, due to take place at say 11 o'clock on Wednesday, if that meeting went ahead at 10 o'clock without any notice being given, there may be issues there as to whether that's still being held in public. So the key points are there's, there's flexibility and, and a general dispensation of the requirement to give further notice, but some caveats to that and um, fairness and other procedural requirements still need to be complied with. I'm going to pass over to Matt who will talk about the various online platforms and the GDPR requirements. Okay, good morning everyone. So far we've looked at the legal position and I want to take a look at some of the practical issues that arise when we hold virtual meetings and I think there are essentially two elements involved. Firstly, you need to choose how you conduct the meeting itself where all or most of your participants are working remotely and in order to do that you need to choose a video conferencing platform. Um, as you'll know there are a number of options out there. We've got Zoom which we're using right now and in fact 200 million people around the world are also using Zoom at the moment. Now that's up from 10 million a month or two ago in that distant era when we could actually get dressed for work or go to the supermarket twice in one day. Um, so it's not a surprise that in the last week or so um, a lot of underemployed tech commentators have been shouting online about security flaws in Zoom's model and I think it's fair to say that a number of the problems that have been identified are simply the result of a massive increase in inexperienced non-commercial users using the platform for something that it wasn't really designed for. With the appropriate meeting controls in place I think Zoom is actually still a useful platform, particularly for a training session um, with a defined number of participants whom we know and we've invited and I hope we're demonstrating that to you today. And remember also that people troll real life council meetings too. Just ask Cambridge City Council who had Extinction Rebellion abseil into their council chamber last year. There's also Skype for Business and Microsoft Teams. Uh, both of these platforms are owned and operated by Microsoft and that's an advantage because almost all of us uh, use Microsoft products at work uh, all day every day and I know many of our local authority clients already use Teams for their work and um, the courts in fact have been using Skype for business to conduct virtual hearings. Um, in addition, these uh, products have another advantage and that's unlike Zoom, their servers are based in the EU, which avoids the need for potentially problematic transfers of personal data to the US and I'll talk about that again in a second. I'm going to suggest that these two products, Microsoft products, are probably a better option than Zoom for conducting more sensitive business. Finally, uh, fourth example, WebEx. This is a product from Cisco. Uh, it has even more users than Zoom worldwide, 325 million, uh, particularly in North America. Uh, WebEx offers slightly more generous features in its free version than Zoom, but like Zoom, it's ultimately based in the US. There are, of course, many other options to choose from. There's a very helpful paper that's been produced by the Family Law Bar Association, and I'm happy to share that um, if that would be helpful. That's got some good practical advice on how to download the app and how to use it. And as James mentioned, we've also got copies of protocols used by authorities north of the border in Scotland, uh, where they've had video uh, conferencing for meetings much longer than we have. Um, secondly, given that we're talking about public meetings, we actually need to let the public attend. Um, after all, we do need to take the strain off Netflix and Amazon Prime, and I think Tiger King can wait till later. I'll be binging on three hours of overview and scrutiny committee before catching up on five seasons of planning committee tonight. Um, now, most local authorities already webcast their meetings, and fortunately, in most cases, it's fairly straightforward to adapt to your existing webcast infrastructure, 
uh, to stream remote meetings. And I know a number of our clients use Public Eye to broadcast their meetings online, uh, and their website has a very helpful guide on this very issue, including this very neat illustration to demonstrate just how easy it is. Okay, so some data protection implications. Mostly this is about security. Um, in data protection terms, we're talking about the integrity and confidentiality data protection principle. And I think really your main concern is um, securing your meeting against Zoom bombers or Teams trolls, uh, people like that. And you can do that by very carefully controlling your permissions, uh, particularly when it comes to who is actually allowed to participate. And this uh, webinar is a good example. We've got a host, and that's me. We've got panelists who you can see on the screen with the exception of Damien, who's not been able to turn his webcam on. Uh, and then we've got you, the participants, uh, watching, uh, but not able to interrupt or share uh, unwelcome messages while we talk. Now, uh, as James reminded us earlier, and Isabella too, this is a meeting in public, not a public meeting. So uh, to that end, you can definitely control um, who is able to actually participate and limit that to the people that need to or are authorized to do so. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, there's also the issue of third, part, uh, third country transfers. Um, many of the uh, video conferencing providers are based in the States. Um, now, Zoom and WebEx are both certified under the EU-US Privacy Shield. So on paper, at least, it is permissible to transfer personal data uh, to using their services. But there are lingering doubts among practitioners about the adequacy of Privacy Shield. And in fact, there are two cases currently at the Court of Justice of the European Union, which are seeking to invalidate it. Um, so if you are sending personal data to the US using these services, you'll certainly need to state that in your corporate privacy notices. But as a general rule of thumb, I'd probably recommend for sensitive business, EU-based providers are generally a better bet. Ultimately, it comes down to risk assessment, balancing the security risks against the need to keep our local democracy functioning. And it's clearly not acceptable, even in the meantime, uh, the current situation where almost all local authority businesses ground to a halt with meetings canceled until further notice. So it's really important that we get uh, remote meetings working as soon as possible. You need to choose the platform that works best for you and your members, and you'll need to take advice from your colleagues in IT and maybe also from a barrister, preferably at Cornerstone. I'll now hand over to Damien, who's going to discuss the inspection and supply of documents. Matt, thank you, and I hope I can be heard. Um, I do apologize for um, uh, not being able to show a picture. It worked in the rehearsal yesterday. Um, it, my defense is that it, uh, there seems to be some updating required on the webcam, which we've tried to do at this end, but which uh, has had to stop at a point before um, we can, uh, I can get the picture to be shown. Um, just to check that I can be heard, I hope. Is that the case? Uh, I'm grateful. Um, but perhaps I'm standing in for those um, of your members, elected members who are less web um, uh, savvy, um, and uh, some of whom you've mentioned in, in questions. Um, but apologies that it's just my voice. I'll be fairly brief. Um, the key point is that the um, provision of um, access to the public to documents on decision making uh, under both your council and executive functions uh, can be handled as you would expect as you would have seen from public uh, from putting it on your um, website function side um, the normal um, agendas reports minutes and so on straightforwardly um, can go on the website but so also can um, the right of um, your own elected members to inspect papers relating to business. And whether that's something a council will want to do, I think is rather doubtful. And so that leaves the point that members do still seem to have that right, um, not that perhaps they exercise it that often, uh, but from time to time to, to inquire into or to ask to see the papers uh, that are relevant to forthcoming or recent business. Um, also, the register of members addresses, committee memberships and of officer delegations, what the committee structures are and so on. Uh, under section 100G of the 72 Act, um, that too could go on a website. Um, uh, indeed, um, we'll probably need to do so if it isn't already uh, to meet the uh, inspection requirement, um, and that may give it some greater prominence. The only other point under council functions is that of the group of public publication posting and making available of a document um, at the offices of the council, 
The wording of the last of those is a little strange because it doesn't directly fit with the wording in section 100B6, where um, you have to make reports available at the meeting to those attending the meeting for their use during the meeting. Um, because that isn't limited to meetings at your offices. You can have meetings in other locations, obviously. Um, and the, 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 so there is a slight question mark about whether that uh, works as effectively, that provision as intended, although the intention is, is, is clear. Um, and I think as um, has been said in the current situation of national crisis, it's a matter of uh, doing the best as, that one can in the circumstances. Um, individuals do still seem to have the right, by the way, to require the local authorities to supply them with copies of documents. So somebody, even though they could probably download them, would appear still to be able to ask you to do that. And you still seem to have the duty where the press pay or the newspapers pay, uh, if they wish to, to have um, uh, actual copies supplied to them. Uh, they're not disapplied. On the executive side, they are. The executive arrangements are much more straightforward. The agendas and reports beforehand, the papers afterwards that you put on your website. Uh, and as it says on the slide, the inspection or supply um, for a fee of background documents uh, and so on is disapplied. So if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, two small points on the local government bodies regulations. Those cover officer decisions delegated from committees. They can go on the website in the same way to meet the inspection requirement. Um, or by such other means as appropriate. So in fact, that, uh, that wording replicates what's already in the regulation, but takes away the requirement for them to be displayed at the council's offices. The police and crime pan panel's point is simply that where a police or crime panel, either in Wales or if it's uh, one of those that's not a local government committee, has been created by the Secretary of State rather than coming out of local government itself, um, part four of the regulations apply where relevant the uh, the rules we've been discussing in parts two and three of the regulations to those panels. Um, finally, just on um, freedom of information and the environmental information regulations, obviously those duties continue and may be relevant in this uh, context. Uh, many of you will know that the ICO, the commissioner, has said that she won't penalise public authorities for, as she puts it, prioritising other areas during the national emergency, and that applies on the FOI side um, as well as on the data protection side. But there may be a point that FOI or, or the environmental regulations could be used to test or challenge authorities' compliance with these rules that we're discussing now, perhaps by asking for papers which would otherwise have been made, have made available at the meeting um, physically during it, or afterwards, or indeed exercising or trying to get round where there isn't now a duty to supply the papers by using FOI for that purpose. Um, if that's the case, section 21 of FOI, an, an exemption for information accessible to the public by, uh, to the applicant rather, by other means, um, is likely to be available and indeed fits well from the wording with uh, a statutory obligation to, um, uh, that applies uh, as at the moment uh, to communicate the information on, on request. But there isn't an environmental information regulations equivalent to section 21. The environmental regulations are very broad. Um, and so include quite a lot of local authority information in any event. Um, I suspect they may also apply to quite a lot of information if there are, that may be relevant to the current emergency, if there are questions about how it's being handled. Uh, but that's all I have to say. My apologies again for, uh, for being absent uh, other than, uh, than, than on audio. Thank you, Damien. Um, one of the questions that we've had during the course of the um, seminar so far as uh, will the slides be available? Uh, yes, they will be. Again, like any of the other documents we've referred to, um, they can be uh, requested uh, and supplied at the uh, end of this webinar uh, from the clerks uh, and the email address will come up on the last slide uh, if uh, Matt Lewin has been doing his job properly, uh, which I think he has. So hopefully on the screen in front of you now we've got um, the first of six questions we hope to uh, get through in the next 15 minutes or so uh, and we've had a number coming in during the course of the uh, webinar as well which we'll try and pick up on. Uh, the question, question one is how do we exclude the public and press from a virtual uh, meeting uh, when going into part two and I think Matt uh, has uh, put his hand up to answer this one. Thank you Matt. Thanks, James. I think it depends on the model that you've chosen. If you've gone for that 
uh, if you're webcasting your meeting, it might be as simple as pausing or even stopping the webcast, which will enable the meeting to go ahead uh, in a normal way as a normal Zoom or Microsoft Teams meeting might go ahead. Um, and obviously without the public and the press uh, attending via the webcast. Um, alternatively, you could set up a separate meeting on the same platform. Um, so certainly the premium version of Zoom allows you to set up meetings and sub meetings, um, or you might even uh, run the meeting, particularly for private deliberations where members are exercising decision-making responsibilities, that might be on a separate platform altogether, um, just to make sure that there's no uh, data leak, inadvertent data leak. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, the, the second question is, how do we deal with the late submission of, of evidence before um, it says here licensing hearings, but but any hearing, and um, I think Rishi uh, is was had put a hand up to answer this. Um, yes, thanks, James. Um, I I think this is a, a tricky issue even in non-COVID times. Um, those, especially that do licensing, will know that there are regs dealing specifically with this and actually allow an authority to take into account evidence produced either before the hearing or with the consent of all parties at the hearing. But the question of what before the hearing actually means and what the appropriate cutoff point is, um, is, is quite ambiguous. Um, I think what's important to bear in mind in these types of situations, and this goes beyond licensing hearings, is that in addition to any specific regulations, there will always be a consideration of common law fairness um, and you know, questions of whether the late evidence um, for example, may compromise procedural fairness for any of the parties. Um, so in principle, um, local authorities could adopt some sort of cut-off point system, whether that's you know, five days before or something like that. But in, in reality, you will need to allow some flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis, because it may, it may be that the late evidence um, is laid with good reason, or it may in fact be that the late evidence is um, you know, absolutely crucial to your decision making to reach a fair decision, or indeed that it's simply something so straightforward like two photographs that actually no other parties object to it and it can easily be digested and responded to. Thanks, James. Thank you. And um, the third question we're going to look at is, uh, and it's one that's been raised by a number of you in a number of different guises, how do we determine whether or not to have our annual council? And it's one that uh, Damien and I um, have looked at. Uh, I'm going to kick off on it by drawing your attention to um, uh, Regulation 6C, which disapplies the provisions of uh, Paragraph 1 and, um, let me just get it up, uh, uh, 7 of the Schedule 12 of the Local Government Act. Um, paragraph one of Schedule 12 says a principal council shall in every year hold an annual meeting. Now, if that's disapplied, the requirement to hold an annual meeting uh, then uh, flies off. There's no requirement to have an annual meeting. And then if one goes to back to the regulations um, and goes to Regulation 4.2, if you don't have an annual meeting, appointments that would have required to be made will hold over until you next time you have one. So I think that's part partial answer to the question. The second approach I would take is it, if you decide to have a full council meeting in any event, your constitution may already provide for how that is to um, be called, who has the power, what are the preconditions for calling a full council meeting. Um, because that is indeed what paragraph two of, of Schedule 12 uh, uh, applies for. Um, the third point before handing over to Damien I'll make is, that I think, in answer to a, a, a question from Susan Swell, which was, can the chief executive um, amend standing orders or take such uh, what role can they take? Well, that again may depend on their power under the Constitution. Um, standing orders are part of the Constitution uh, and the Constitution may provide for how they are to be amended and different parts of the Constitution may be amended uh, potentially in different ways in my view. But as Rushi said earlier, 
Yeah, if you are amending the constitution, it is likely to be a power that hasn't been delegated to the chief executive, um, and uh, it may need to. Um, you may need to have a meeting of full council to deal with that. Uh, anyway, Damien, I said that um, it was going to be a two-hander, so I wondered whether you had any input before we move on to the next question. Uh, James, yes, thank you. Um, just a small, a small rider to what, what you've just, just said, which I, I, I very much agree with. Um, I, I think there may be some councils that um, uh, depute amendments to their standing orders, um, perhaps where they arise from a change to the law to the monitoring officer rather than to the chief exec and it's possible that therefore in some cases the monitoring officer may have that role um, that could be interpreted to apply for in, in these circumstances. Um, I suspect though in the end the, the um, if, we, if we go back to where you started the starting position of this is that you don't have to have an annual meeting. In practice if the, if the feeling amongst the, the, the members is that a, a meeting is wanted and one has already been scheduled, then obviously the council doesn't have a problem, provided it can convert to fitting within the regulations in practice, as a practical means. If it hasn't, and this may be a matter of where you are in the electoral cycle within a given council, if you're having it in April or May, you probably already, you may already have it scheduled. If you're um, not having it until after the May elections, then there may be uh, a question of formality still to meet. Um, uh, and therefore, it may boil down to where you are in your cycle, what's already in your timetable. Um, and a point that was raised in some correspondence surrounding one of the questions, whether or not you can get political agreement uh, informally within your council as to what to do, which obviously isn't a directly legal matter. But if there is a, uh, a council that doesn't have, you know, a majority or where at least two parties can form a majority and, and decide what, informally between them what to do, uh, then it may be, may be more difficult. It may be that you have to go as far as having some sort of virtual ordinary meeting in order to decide what to do about an annual meeting. But short of that, um, you don't have to take a decision on an annual meeting. Your starting position is that you're not having one unless you choose to have one, as I understand it. Back to you. Thank you. And th does it, if, if anyone else on the panel has, has an input, we move on to the next question, which Matt has taken us to. Um, who can um, <clears throat> make changes to procedural rules? Can the chief executive or monitoring officer do this? And that's something I've alluded to in part, but Rishi, you have a, a, a bit more of an input on this. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks. James, I think between you and Damien, you've probably answered this. I think it, it depends entirely on your constitutional arrangement. But if you, haven't you know, if you haven't delegated or made provision for emergency powers to either your chief exec or monitoring officer uh, or another appropriate officer, then it's likely that you will have to go back to full council um, to, address, you know, to, to bring in any new standing orders or amend any uh, standing orders. Thank you. Next question is, is looking at the requirements in Regulation 5 that members must be able to be heard, to hear and be heard and where practicable to be seen and, and be seen. Um, uh, <coughs> the, there, there are a number of issues that will arise. One is that what happens if a member goes out of contact during the course of the meeting? Um, as long as my initial view on that, as long as you don't befall below a quorum on the meeting, um, then the member's temporary absence won't invalidate the meeting. Uh, it should be clear when the member is not online uh, and if they come back on within a short period of time, uh, they can, um, there could be a, either a short adjournment if they go off or when they come back, they can be, uh, what has happened can, can be uh, conveyed to them. If they leave the meeting and can't come back in at all, then um, the approach that Highland Council have taken and their protocol, which I referred to earlier, is that that member will uh, be treated as having left the meeting as though they got up and walked out of the room physically at that point. And that's why it, it's important to have an eye on whether you have a quorum of, me, of members present or not. My view is that a court looking at any challenge based on breach of Regulation 5 is going to have regard to 
the practicalities and the attempts made to meet them as much as in spirit as in the uh, letter of the law. Um, the uh, second issue that arises under this point is, is whether members need to be um, hear and be heard at all times, or whether a, a bit as we've been doing, uh, the person speaking is um, is the only one with their microphone switched on. In my view, it should be possible for members to hear and be heard at all times, but provide, <coughs> um, but they should be encouraged to um, self-discipline and, um, as we are doing, have our microphones switched off unless they absolutely want to say something. And they will ha have to realise that the ability to um, uh, take audible part in the proceedings uh, that might be capable in in a, in a actual meeting is far more restricted in a virtual meeting because it will uh, seriously compromise the ability to have a uh, a sensible meeting so uh, and that is why the person the the who is uh, in charge of the whatever platform is being used should have the ability to prevent uh, members or members of the public uh, seeking to frustrate the orderly conduct of the meeting. And m most councils will have rules to deal with that in any event. So uh, my initial view anyway, and this is very much early stage, is that members, you should make a provision for members to hear and be heard all the time, if possible. Uh, see and be seen is where practicable, and um, using something like Zoom should render that practicable. Um, so that that was my response to 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 that, I don't know whether any, any other um, member of the panel wishes to add to that. Um, James, I could add very briefly that I think um, perhaps a rider to the question or that's been raised um, around it is whether um, there's any difficulty over members of the public trying to address the meeting uh, who have encountered the sort of difficulties or as witless as I am in this regard perhaps um, as to whether if uh, they can't be heard there is some difficulty over whether the, the, the meeting can proceed uh, and I very much um, support what you're saying as to what the attitude that a court would take um, in, based on practicality. I mean there is a distinction between hearing and being seen by members of the members of the public being seen or, or, or um, heard by um, members of the council um, but nonetheless, it can't be, as you say, the position uh, that an individual could frustrate the meeting either accidentally or in reality or designedly um, uh, through the through technical means. The whole thing must be based on, on practicality, and I'm sure that would be the approach. Thank you, Damien. Just to picking up a couple, a couple of questions that have uh, appeared online. Should meetings be recorded? I don't think there's any requirement that they be recorded, but uh, it would clearly be sensible to do so. And uh, a useful suggestion um, by um, J.C. Newman, um, would pre-recording of submissions by speakers be sensible? Um, yes, um, I think that would be. Uh, certainly uh, allow for a coherent presentation, but I, I don't uh, consider that allowing someone to put a pre-recorded question would um, be sufficient to comply with the requirements to hear and, and be heard by them. Um, before I leave this point, I, Isabella may have uh, a point she wishes to make. Isabella. Thank you, James. And um, just in relation to the question that's been submitted in relation to that by Carly Lavender, um, it wouldn't be sufficient to conduct the entire meeting, record it um, on video, and then upload it onto YouTube afterwards, because at the very least, um, members of the public must be able to hear what's going on in real time and where practicable be able to see what's going on in real time. Thank you. Um, if, if no one else has any further, can we move to the last question on the slides and um, I'll have a look through to see what else we can answer whilst this is being dealt with. Matt, I think you're um, going to deal with the, the last question on the slide. Yeah, it's a practical question about the chat function on uh, Zoom and the other platforms. Obviously, those can be helpful, 
and they replicate the note passing that would normally take place in a, in a meeting. On the other hand, particularly where members and officers are not necessarily that familiar with how these platforms work, there's always the risk of inadvertently disclosing a message to the wrong party. So you might find it um, easier just to disable that function to make sure there's no uh, accidental messaging and encourage members to use some other channel like WhatsApp or um, email to pass notes among one another if they do want to do that but bearing in mind that 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 the written communications could potentially be information held for the purposes of FOIA uh, and uh, that causes different uh, issues which I think are probably beyond the scope of today but it's worth thinking about. Um, we also had a question from um, Wendy I think just on the technical um, yes on the technical capabilities of Zoom. Now they, you might notice that they, in the window, claim that these kinds of communications are end-to-end -end encrypted, which is the most secure form of encryption. They're technically not, um, because Zoom um, holds the encryption key, so in extremists could decrypt uh, the messaging and disclose it, for instance, to American law enforcement agencies. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it non-GDPR compliant, um, or the fact that their servers are based in the US is not necessarily in breach of GDPR because they're certified under Privacy Shield. Um, but this is why I recommend uh, recommended that for more sensitive business, platforms other than Zoom are, are used. So I'll mute myself, thank you for that. Um, one of the another questions coming along the same lines is the ability for officers to give confidential advice to the chairman during meetings uh, you have to remember that you're not restricted to just one channel of communication and indeed whilst this has been uh, this webinar has been going on we've been communicating with each other via a um, uh, whatsapp chat group um, so that it, it is possible to have several lines of communication running at one time um, on different platforms, uh, provided you don't mix up your platforms, um, uh, which may make it uh, easier and, and more uh, certain that you're not um, uh, disclosing information to a party that you shouldn't disclose it to. Um, so that that's one potential workaround at that point. Um, we've got, um, we've just run past our time. We have uh, a considerable number of other questions. I'm not sure we're going to be able to deal with them all uh, it, uh, online today. We've tried to work through um, as many of them as, as possible. Uh, we'll uh, try and respond to those that we haven't responded to uh, yet. And um, And uh, uh, if you have any further questions, please email them in. And um, you will see on our screen the um, email address if you have more questions for instructions and inquiries. Uh, our clerk's email addresses, and that includes any requests for the slides for the documentation that we've referred to um, and uh, we will ourselves have a look at um, seeing whether we can answer some of the questions that have come in um, in writing but um, as I say at this stage we've had so many I'm not sure we can undertake to do so. So unless anyone else on the team has further points that I should be raising I'll say thank you very much to uh, my four co-hosts, for those who've been supporting us, uh, and uh, a very good morning to all of you, um, and um, I hope you stay safe. Um, final point is that if um, uh, we may well rerun this seminar with um, a more uh, focused approach on a number of problems uh, in the following weeks, if that would be of interest to you, please let us know. Thank you very much indeed. And goodbye.